Are we missing anybody? <coughs> Everybody should have a partner, just like when you're a little kid and you're on the bus. Do you have your partner? Just to make sure. <laughs> oh, right, we do have partners. Right, we do. <laughs> That's a, yeah, I like having a little light. <laughs> okay, good morning. Everyone doing well after their first day? Yeah? You ready to go? <laughs> okay, so today we're going to talk about absorption, or this morning, and after my lecture, Mary Jane and Ivana will be talking about phytoplankton in particular. Good morning. <coughs> See, I told you we were missing some people. So, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit more about the electron, electromagnetic spectrum and how it relates to the actual process of what absorption is. And then I'll talk about the major absorptions in the ocean and talk a little bit about their, how we measure them and their natural variability so that we can begin to compare the, the variations that when we measure absorption, begin to understand how much is due to natural processes and how much might be due to measurement processes because that's what we'll be heading for in the lab. And <clears throat> I also have uh, some slides on how we measure absorption in the ocean. I'm just going to keep an eye on the time. If we don't do it specifically in this lecture, we will get to it throughout um, the next couple of days as we do it in the lab. So <clears throat> I want to start with the electromagnetic radiation. And I think it's important to understand the basis of absorption because then it helps you think about absorption, at least it helped me think about absorption in a different way when I learned about this when I was in graduate school. So, um, <clears throat> so if you think about the fact that when you have charged particles, um, a dipole, that, and they're oscillating, that can create this um, electric field, which is this oscillation between plus and minus, and you've all seen something like this. And when that particle moves, it's creating a magnetic field. And some books, depending upon which textbook you use, the magnetic field is either B or H. And those are at 90 degrees. And so the magnetic field will, will oscillate um, as this energy is propagating, and it's that right-hand rule. But in this drawing, you can see that the energy is propagating this way, and you've got the magnetic field in this direction and the electric field going in this direction. And of course, when we talk about polarization, the alignment of this will become important. And I think Who's talking about polarization? Is that like this week or next week? Not this week. OK. We'll get to polarization. But you'll probably see something very similar to this in that lecture. <coughs> so, so when you get this oscillation, the range of the frequencies that we see in that oscillation is what's described by the electromagnetic spectrum. And so here we have the wavelength. Um, going from short to long, frequency would go in this direction. And of course, we remember from what Kurt said yesterday that the energy associated with each one of those frequencies or wavelengths um, is dependent upon the wavelength. And the, the shorter the wavelength, the more energy in each one of those, say if it's light, each one of those photons. And so, you know, here we go from gamma rays to x-rays, and then here's the little tiny part of visible spectrum and into the infrared and microwave. So since this energy is propagating, um, when materials or compounds absorb this radiation, they're absorbing this energy. And the energy that they, that's, um, that's associated with each part of the spectrum that they might be absorbing is, is given by hc over lambda. And so it de what happens to the molecule or a compound when it absorbs energy depends upon the, the specific part of the spectrum in which it's absorbing. And that will determine how much energy. And so therefore, it really depends on the wavelength um, of the energy that it's absorbing. And so just to think about that, here's the electromagnetic spectrum again. And so this is what happens. If a molecule absorbs microwave radiation, it undergoes rotation, okay? 
because that amount of energy that's in this very long wavelength is sufficient to cause that reaction in a molecule. If, however, it's absorbing in the infrared, that causes molecules to vibrate, right? So I just show like a little, this is, say, a water molecule, and you start to see the vibration between the oxygen and the hydrogens, and the bonds start to vibrate. Well, and that's the energy that causes things to heat up, right? That's, so the thermal infrared causes things to warm up because that's a sufficient amount of energy to get the molecule vibrating. The absorption of wavelengths associated with visible light and ultraviolet right, light, and here's a sort of schematic of a molecule, um, where these are electronic shells, and you can get this transition of electrons from one shell to another. So it takes quite a bit more energy to move electrons than it does to simply vibrate. And absorbing energy associated with X-ray wavelengths or frequencies causes photoionization. Literally, the absorption of some energy and the ejection of an electron which ionizes the molecule or the um, atom. And then gamma rays, which are very, very high energy, actually changes nuclear configuration. So it depends upon the wavelength that the molecule can absorb the, the, what happens to that molecule. And so when you think about absorption, there's a lot happening at the molecular level. So because we're talking about, when we talk about electronic states, moving electrons between different states, we're talking about the energy associated with visible light or maybe even infra or, uh, ultraviolet light. So as you move this electron from one orbital to another orbital, we call that an electronic state transition. So if it's in one electronic state, it can go to another electronic state, which means that the electron is moving from one, one level to another. And because there's a specific amount of energy to move an electron, we say that this energy is quantized. You can't absorb this much energy and move the electron. You have to absorb exactly this much energy to move the electron from one orbital to another, or potentially this much energy. And so that's called quantization. And if you think about a molecule where the electrons are in one ground state, and the molecule absorbs a sufficient energy to bring the electron to this higher electronic state, the energy associated with that turns out for this particular example, which I'm building a chlorophyll absorption spectrum, turns out to be absorption associated, or the amount of energy associated with a photon at about 440 nanometers. So a molecule of chlorophyll absorbs 440, that moves the electron to a higher state. And you get an absorption peak exactly at the energy equivalent of this state transition. Now chlorophyll is a really interesting molecule because it actually has the capability of measuring two different regions of the spectrum. It also has a second orbital state where an electron can move and the energy associated with that is a little bit lower, which means a longer wavelength. Okay. So those electronic states moving the electrons, those are associated with the two major peaks of absorption for chlorophyll. And you can imagine other pigments which might only have one peak. So within this energy diagram, within each one of these electronic states, there are other variations and higher, um, higher uh, excited states, which are associated with the fact that the molecules might have different vibrational levels within each electronic state. And so you can imagine going from a ground state 
to the major electronic state, or maybe if there's a little bit more energy, you can start some vibration. But that vibration is also quantized. And so there are specific levels of energy that are allowed to set up different modes of vibration. So maybe this mode of vibration, maybe this mode of vibration, maybe this mode. And the molecule might not start in the exact gr lowest ground state. It might already be at some vibrational level because it's warm. And so that would allow for some absorption to go from the ground state, but maybe first vibrational level, to the ground state or to that third ground state plus another vibrational level. The primary um, absorption would be from the ground state of the first level to the ground state of the third level. That's the preferred, but there is some probability that you might be in a higher vibrational level or you might get to a higher vibrational level. And that, these little different amounts of energy here allow for absorption at slightly higher energy. That would be from here to here. Or slightly lower energy, which might be from here to here. So now you start to see that your absorption peak has some side peaks. Okay. Now, if you were at absolute zero temperature when this whole thing occurred, you would only get this one band. But the fact that we have different vibrational states of the molecule is what allows for these harmonic bands here. And of course, you can do the same thing with this other electronic state, this other situation where an electron goes from one um, orbital shell to another with slightly lower amounts of energy required. So, and, and the amount of energy that's associated from say here to here, or from say here to here, is much less than the amount of energy from here to here. This is the equivalent of a visible photon. This is the equivalent of an infrared because that's the different vibrational state, right? And remember, the amount of infrared energy is sufficient to start a molecule vibrating. So when you think about these energy states, you can think about you need a lot of energy to change your electronic state, you need a little bit of energy to change vibrational state. Okay. So then we also have rotational states of the molecule, and these are the sublevels between the vibrational states. And remember, in the spectrum, you only needed sort of a microwave equivalent of energy to start rotation. And so within each electronic state and within each vibrational state, there are rotational states of energy. And so now you start to see the possibilities of going from one electronic state within a vibrational state within a rotational state to the next electronic state its vibrational and rotational state. And so you start to see these lines fill in because each one of these lines is a different amount of energy. This is slightly less energy, slightly more, slightly more, slightly more. This is the main electronic state. This is slightly more energy, slightly less, slightly less. So you're filling in this part to the high energy side of the absorption peak over here. You're filling in this side of the absorption peak with slightly lower energy because we're heading into longer wavelengths, that's these right here. Does everyone see that? And so what we've gone from is a single absorption associated with an electron, a change in, in um, the electronic state to basically an absorption, a smoothed out absorption peak by taking into account the quantization of absorption of visible light under various vibrational states and rotational states of that molecule. Yes? So the solid blue line is the same on, on the representative one on the left, right? Yes. So the lines to the left or the solid blue line? So the signs to the left are higher or lower energy. So it's higher or... Is it? Know, is it? No. It's I'm asking you. Is it higher or lower? Higher energy. higher energy because it's a shorter wavelength, right? So Because this is not a spectrum here. Okay. This is 
so what you're so what you're looking at is going from the lowest electronic state, and you can start at the lowest the electronic state, lowest vibrational state, lowest rotational state, which are all of these, and the potential to do a state transition to its lowest level. That's this peak, that amount of energy. Or you might get to the first rotational state of that. That would be the line right next door. The second rotational state, the first vibrational state, then within that, it's first and second rotational state. And that's filling in, that's a lot more energy than just this amount. So those are the higher energy states here. And the probability that the molecule will go from this level to this level is slightly lower than the probability that it'll go from here to here. And that just has to do with the molecular formation. And so that's why the absorption coefficient is lower, because it's a lower probability of occurrence. So the most preferential occurrence is going from, from this state to this state, and that's the peak. And then there's lower probability of absorption occurring at each one of these different energy states. Lower probability going from your second vibrational state to the ground state in the, in the third transition. Yeah. If you change the temperature of the spectrum, then change. Yes. Yeah, and if the molecule is in a situation where it can, if it's, say, chlorophyll and acetone, it makes a difference the temperature that you're measuring it at. Because, yes, you can be in a different vibrational state. And so when you're making measurements in a solvent and the bonds change, you can get shifts. So if we take chlorophyll in acetone, its absorption peak will necessarily be different than, say, absorption dissolved in water. Because there will be different poles on the bond. The molecule will have a different shape. And so it might have a slightly different, um, the electronic states might be a different amount of energy. And that would mean they'd be shifted. If you take chlorophyll and you put it in a cell and you bind it into, with proteins into a membrane, it has a different ability to, um, for electrons to move through various molecular shells. And so what happens is the absorption peak will shift based upon how much energy it takes to move that electron. And so what we find is that the absorption peak for chlorophyll in a cell is different than the absorption peak for chlorophyll and acetone. So you have to be very careful when you're measuring absorption spectra to know what your molecule is in. Is it dissolved? What kind of a solvent is it in? Is it bound up with proteins? Because it changes its molecular, um, its molecular state and therefore changes the amount of energy that's necessary to move an electron. And so that would change the difference between here and here. If it takes more energy to get that electron to move to the higher shell, then this, this third electronic state will move up. It'll be higher energy if it takes more energy. If it takes less energy, then the absolute amount of energy will be reduced. And so this whole thing would be moved down, maybe if you were in a different solvent. Yes? The absorption probability? Yeah. So if, if you think about, um, sometimes it's easier to think about some more simple molecules, but if you think about um, how the molecule is, um, how electrons are distributed about a molecule and what its vibrational and rotational situation are, there's a greater or lesser likelihood of being able to move an electron to a different electron shell. And it has to do with the formation of where the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and with the shape of the shell if it's, um, if it's a, an atom versus, um, say, oxygen gas, which would be two oxygens bound together as a molecule, or something more complex like chlorophyll. And so the probability of being able to move that electron around and the probability that it can go to, say, a next vibrational state really has to do with literally the, the nuclear formation and the electronic um, orbitals around that molecule. I mean, I talk about shells, but it's really orbitals around that. And so that's, you know, that's 
like hardcore chemistry to sort of talk about the, the probabilities, but you can describe them with a probability distribution of the likelihood that that will occur. Uh, so, yeah. Emmanuel? Yeah, the, the chemists like to do this type of analysis in frequency space. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. And they have a, a mathematical function called a Laurentian, yep. which describes this distribution around that. So yep. Just so you know, that different, again, different disciplines in science look at the same phenomena differently from mm-hmm. perspective. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So. So chlorophyll, and I, I'm, Mary Jane will probably spend more time on this. This is the um, molecular structure of chlorophyll. It's got this um, chlorine ring structure here, which has a lot of nitrogens and some double bonds, and there's a magnesium in the center of it. There's a lot of resonant possibilities here because of these double bonds, and that's what makes it a very efficient absorber. It also is what allows it to have two absorption peaks, unlike a lot of other pigment molecules. This, this structure here, this carbon structure here, a hydrocarbon tail, is what actually roots the molecule into the um, chloroplast membrane. And um, so that kind of roots into the membrane, and then this, this chlorine ring is out, sort of available, rel- 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 ready to absorb light. Um, and so again, here's the energy di- diagram, and this is the blue absorption peak, this is the red absorption peak. And if we look at absorption on this energy scale, there's your blue peak, there's your red peak. Once the molecule absorbs light, it can lose some energy as heat and then it can fluoresce. And so it's fluorescing from the lowest excited state, which is why fluorescence is in the red and we don't have blue fluorescence. We get absorption um, in the blue, but then we lose all of that energy as heat loss. And so fluorescence only occurs from that lowest state. And that's what gives us the red fluorescence. And it's interesting that when you look at the vibrational and rotational orbitals, it doesn't show it very well in this diagram, but the fluorescence is actually a mirror image of this absorption peak. So there's the first vibrational harmonic, that's the second vibrational harmonic, third vibrational harmonic with all the rotationals within each of those. And so the fluorescence actually has a symmetric peak with like a harmonic here as well. Um, and so it just has to do with the probability of the re-emission of light w- with this equivalent amount of energy, which is slightly lower than the absorption of light at that energy. That's why you get a shift in the peak absorption to the peak fluorescence. So here's the absorption spectrum. We call that blue peak the Soray peak. The red peak is called the Q-band absorption. and as you do your chlorophyll analysis this week, I just want to show you what happens. If you take this chlorophyll molecule and you add um, and, you, and you blanch it, which is sort of like heating it, you can lose the phytol tail. So you can remove this part of the molecule and you end up with a molecule called chlorophyll ide. So it's the same molecule, it just doesn't have a tail. And it has an absorption spectrum that looks like this. And then when you um, add some acid or maybe some other heat, you actually lose the magnesium that's in the center of the molecule and it slightly switches its absorption spectrum because you're changing the bonds. And so therefore you're changing um, the quantization or the amount of energy required to move electrons. Because once you remove a a magnesium, it changes the electron orbital, the electron orbitals. Or you can immediately add heat an acid and you can get something called pheophyton and pheophyton is the removal of the magnesium but you maintain the phytol tail so this becomes important because when we're measuring chlorophyll in the lab and we take uh, a filter with phytoplankton on it and we extract it an acetone the chlorophyll has an absorption spectrum that looks like this and an associated fluorescent spectrum which is related to its red or the Q-band absorption peak. We then, and we measure its fluorescence, then we add acid, which removes the magnesium, converts it to pheophyton, which changes the molecular structure, which slightly changes its absorption spectrum, and therefore its fluorescence. Mm 
And so because it will have a different spectrum of, of absorption and a different spectrum of fluorescence, it allows us to separate chlorophyll from theophyton. Theophyton is, an, these are all natural processes in the ocean. We induce it in the lab, but when a zooplankton eats chlorophyll by eating a phytoplankton, the phytoplankton goes through an acidic gut, which removes the magnesium naturally. And so we end up with theophyton in the water, and it's a degraded pigment. It tells us something about how much grazing has occurred in the water. And so this is a natural process, and we use it to tell us something about degradation. Um, it also allows us, when we do it in the lab, to figure out, and I think the, um, Mary Jane and Ivana will be teaching you this this week, it allows you to separate out how much chlorophyll is in the water and how much phaophyton is in the water naturally. And so it all goes back to the fact that by changing the molecular structure, you're changing the energy of quantization, therefore its absorption, therefore the spectrum of its fluorescence. So it all goes back to the molecular state. Okay. So that's the process of absorption. And so all of the molecules and all of this the constituents that we'll be talking from here on out have specific absorption spectrum. And in your mind, you should be thinking, oh, because their molecular structure is different. And that's why they're absorbing in different regions of the spectrum. That's why they have a narrow absorption peak. That's why they have a very broad absorption peak. It has to do with their molecular structure. And so if you do anything to change the molecular structure of the constituents that you're interested in, because you left your sample out on deck or you didn't process it right away. You're changing your sample at the molecular level, which will change the absorption properties and will change um, your ability to reconstruct the absorption that was actually occurring in the water. Okay. All right. So here's some absorption spectra measured and this is the spectrum from blue to red, measured in three ocean environments. The open ocean, a coastal regime, and an estuary. Okay. So I want you to tell me, what do those three have in common? They all absorb in the red. In the red. Okay. So there's something common to all of these ocean regimes that they have a very strong red absorption. Okay. And it turns out it's due to water. They all have water because they're all oceans, right? Okay, where they're different is in the blue, right? They have variable blue absorption. And so knowing something about what the ocean is comprised of when you're out in the open ocean, the blue ocean, versus coastal waters versus estuarine waters, you might think to yourself, well, they have different materials that are differentially absorbing in the blue. And so we'll be talking about what these materials are, but most of the variability and absorption that we find is in this region of the spectrum. And that's why most satellites expend most of their channels in the blue and the green, because that's where most of the variability is. The fact that water absorbs very strongly in the red means that there's relatively little variability in the red, although people will argue now that there's much more interesting features occurring in the red and infrared that we're now beginning to exploit. But early on, there weren't as many channels in the red. Okay, so absorption is a conservative property, thank goodness. Um, that really helps us out a lot. And so what that allows us to say is that the total absorption of a water sample or um, a, a volume of water in the ocean is determined by the sum of all of the uh, um, individual absorbing constituents. So if you could go out and you could identify all of the molecules and all of the particles in the ocean and you could measure their absorption spectrum, you could add them up, it would be equal to a measurement of the total bulk absorption of that water sample. And so we could say that the total absorption is due to um, the water absorption, and these are all spectral, plus all of the dissolved compounds, plus all of the par particle compounds. Okay. 
The other thing is that absorption is proportional to concentration of any um, constituent. And so, for example, um, the absorption by chlorophyll, which has units of per meter for some um, solution of chlorophyll, is equal to the chlorophyll concentration times its specific absorption coefficient. And so chlorophyll has um, a, a um, material-specific absorption spectrum. So if you had one microgram of chlorophyll in a liter of solution, you could measure its absorption spectrum, and it would be the same every time you do it, as long as you have one microgram. Right? That's called a specific absorption. So it's a mass-specific absorption spectrum. So once you quantify what this is, it's a known and it's a constant, and you don't ever have to do it again if you've done it well. Then you can multiply it by a concentration of chlorophyll, any concentration of chlorophyll, and figure out what the total absorption would be. So that's one of the um, nice uh, properties that falls out of Beer's Law. I think, we'll be, I think you did a little bit of Beer's Law yesterday in lab. So part of the challenge is figuring out what these mass-specific absorption spectra are, but once you figure those out, it becomes a terrific way for either estimating concentration if you know the total absorption or estimating total absorption if you know the concentration. You can sort of move back and forth with this. Yeah. Yes. In fact, that's how we calibrate fluorometers in the lab because we know this. And so you can measure an absorption spectrum, know exactly how much chlorophyll is in that solution. Yeah. And I can point you to data. You can download the data. And it, of course, depends on whether that chlorophyll is dissolved in 100% acetone, 90% acetone, methanol, blah, 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 because it will change the molecular structure and will therefore change its absorption spectrum. But once you know what your solvent is, yes, it's very well known. Yeah. Okay, so it's pretty impractical to actually measure the absorption spectrum for each absorber. And so we tend to group components by their common absorption properties. Um, and we also tend to group them because we have to, because of the way that we process water samples, we tend to group things together. And so I'll show you how that is. But if you think about the ocean as being comprised of water and phytoplankton and zooplankton and bacteria and other organic um, particles in here and inorganic sediments, and this is supposed to represent a uh, dissolved organic molecule, um, you can add all those up, their absorption spectra, and get the total. So let's start with water. Um, this is, is this the, yeah, this is the 1997 paper where um, Pope and Fry measured the absorption spectrum in an integrating cavity absorption meter, which we will have in the lab um, while you're here. Um, so we could actually try to measure absor absorption by pure water if we could get very pure water. Um, but essentially what you see is that the absorption per meter as a function of wavelength is for water is very, very low in the blue and increases in the red. And you should notice that there are these little shoulders here. Those are vibrational harmonics. The main electronic state is somewhere out here. But these are the vibrational, and then what fills in between the vibrations are the rotation, the rotational um, uh, states for the water molecule. There's a really nice compendium of a history of measuring absorption by pure water at this website, which you'll get. It won't be cut off in your um, PDF, but it only goes up through 97. But you can actually download this data um, from that compendium. So um, in 97, also, Scott Pega and um, his colleagues did a comparison of the absorption coefficients of pure water measured in a variety of different ways in a, by a variety of different people. It was sort of the, the history of absorption by pure water. And what you see is that everybody did a reasonable job out in the red. Of course, we're on a log scale. But there were lots and lots of variability in the blue. Because when you have very, very low absorption, sometimes it's very difficult to resolve what the absorption is. And so many of the, these variations that he, they observed were methodological. And so being able to actually go back and measure 
absorption in a configuration that minimizes those methodological uncertainties um, has greatly helped us. So a lot of, so, so this is very methodological and it's it, it, interesting to go back and read these original papers and how they made that absorption measurement. But when you can do a good job and measure absorption, one of the things that varies naturally, independent of methodological problems, um, is, for example, the variation in water absorption as a function of temperature. So here's this very low absorption in the blue. But as you change the temperature from cool water to warm water, you can see that there's quite a big difference in the absorption spectrum. So why might that be? Exactly. Higher temperature gives you different vibrational states, which gives you different probabilities for absorption. And it occurs, you can blow this harmonic state up. This is the vibrational harmonic state. This is another vibrational harmonic state. This is another vibrational harmonic state. So you can actually predict where this will occur. It's in the, in the regions where you're changing the vibration of the water molecule. And so you see it most pronounced here in the red, but you can also see some variations here and here. So, um, and here, so here's um, the absorption as a function of temperature at one wavelength. This was at, at 740, so it's about right here. And you can see how nice and linear that relationship is. So the reason that is, 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 is also because you can get clustering of water molecules. So when you're in a vibrational state, in a low vibrational state, water molecules tend to cluster because they have, it's a polar molecule and they develop hydrogen bonds that hold them together. And as they warm up and they start to vibrate, the water molecules literally push each other apart. And so the size of these clusters of molecules with their hydrogen bonds actually um, decreases the warmer you get. So the warmer the water, the fewer, I'm sorry, the, the warmer the water, warmer the water, the fewer molecules in a cluster because um, they're vibrating so rapidly. And so that's part of what's changing these, this um, absorption and, and it turns out scattering as well. So we can also think about what happens when you dissolve a salt in water. And um, you can see that this is the beam attenuation, but it's the, uh, um, the, you can also think of this as the absorption decreasing as you add salt at one wavelength. This is at 715. But if you pick another wavelength, you can actually see the absorption increasing as a function of salt. And that's because this is the variation in absorption due to salt. And so the magnitude of this change depends on how much salt you have on the water, have in the water. So if you have, and this is one milligram, or, or actually this is based on salinity. So this is one part per thousand. If you have 20 parts per thousand, it will be 20 times this curve. And it's lower here and it's higher here in terms of absorption. So this is the natural variation in absorption by water if you go out and just measure seawater. The absorption by seawater will be different in cold versus warm and in salty versus fresh. So how many people thought that the absorption by pure water was a constant? Nobody did? Awesome for you. It varies tremendously and it becomes important when we use water as our calibration material because it makes a difference if the water that we use is warm or cold or has a little bit of salt in it. Okay. All right, so the next component are the dissolved in, is dissolved inorganic matter. And this tends to be mo mostly important down in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. This is from a paper by um, Ken Johnson and um, Lee Coletti. And these are the absorption spectra associated with different concentrations of salt ions. So there's bromide, bromine, there's iodide, there's um, um, hydrogen sulfide, there's sulfate, 
there's nitrate. And so you can see that each one of these particular molecules has a very distinct absorption spectrum. And again, the magnitude of this will be proportional to the concentration of each one of those um, compounds. And so this is actually the basis for ultraviolet detection of nitrate and hydrogen sulfide that the ISIS is based upon. I don't think we have an ISIS here, but you can find all sorts of data online um, from Ken Johnson's group making use of the fact that, say, for nitrate, which is right here, that you can measure the absorption spectrum in the UV and extract the nitrate absorption from that spectrum. So those are the salts. Color dissolved organic matter, so now we're looking at organic matter. We, yeah. On the last slide, um, how is it that we can differentiate that nitrate in the water versus Well, you hope you don't have them all in the water. I mean, that's, if you go back and you look at their algorithms, they're mostly concerned with some of the salts at separating the salts from um, the nitrate. And so interestingly, they do not pick a wavelength where nitrate is maximally absorbing, which is what you would typically do because you would want to have the greatest signal to noise. They pick a wavelength out here where the bromine goes down. Bromine goes to zero here. So therefore, if you measure the absorption out here, you can be certain that it's due to nitrate and not bromine. Um, but however, you know, then you, have these other compounds. So you, knowing the shape of the curve would allow you to do sort of a multiple linear regression. And um, so you can use that approach as well. Yeah. And of course, once we get to CDOM, CDOM's in here too, and it's going to show up. It's not in this graph because it's so unwieldy, but it's in there too. And it, and it does lead to some problems in estimating nitrate in the UV. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so we take a water sample and we filter it and we end up with the filtrate and we end up with the particles on the filter. And I want to talk about the filtrate first. If you look at the absorption by CDOM, you see that it's basically exponential from blue to red. But the slope of that exponential varies really significantly depending upon the composition of CDOM. And we know almost nothing about the composition of CDOM. It is really, um, really complex. The molecules are rapidly changing because of microbial activity, because of photolysis, not photolysis, um, photochemical degradation. There's lots of things that change the chemical composition. And here's an example from an, um, John Kirk's book for some water samples in inland waters in Australia. And you can see there's huge variations in the concentration of CDOM. These are huge, 20 per meter. You might get this really red water. This is from a paper by Heidi Dearson talking about um, spectra of reflectance and the color of light. And this is a paddle from Grace Chang, showing which was a white paddle, but it looks red because the, there's so much CDOM in the water. Here again is one of those beautiful wave photos, again showing a lot of dissolved organic matter. So, so we're looking at this electron or this um, exponential absorption, and you can describe this curve with a very simple ec um, exponential function, depending upon what region of the spectrum you're looking at. People have found that you actually need maybe an exponential function from 400 to 600 and maybe you need a different exponential function further in the UV, which suggests that there's different compounds in that material. And so um, there's a couple of papers talking about this, the fit of using a single exponential function to describe this curve, or maybe some different types of functions. Um, essentially, we're looking at the tail end of an absorption peak, right? This absorption is continuing out into the UV. So if you look at the slope, this is the exponential slope, which describes how steep this curve might be. And because it's an exponential, if you put it on a log scale, and this is from an old paper by Ken Carter, where he looked at different waters off of Florida, you can see that the slope of that absorption curve changes. 
And what he found was that materials that would be described as more humic materials, um, which were marine derived, were very different than dissolved organic matter that was more fulvic in nature or more terrestrial derived. The slope of these is actually steeper than the slope from the marine samples. And so that suggests that this slope has something to do with composition. And so people have been looking at variability in the spectral slope of absorption. Um, and they did some experiments by doing um, mixing, by looking at different fractions of fulvic material and how that would vary the spectral slope of absorption versus wavelength on a log scale. So I, I had a student who looked at the spectral slope for CDOM absorption. And what she did is she took a filter that was 0.2 microns and looked at the absorption of all the material that was less than 0.2 microns and the distribution of the material that had a slope, a very steep slope. Then she looked at filtrate from a 0.7 micron filter. And by difference, she could look at this tiny fraction from 0.2 to 0.7, which is, if you call that dissolved, you've really got dissolved in quotes, right? Because that's actually sort of colloidal sized material. And when she looked at the absorption spectrum of that fraction, the slope was much flatter, which suggested that the material that was colloidal had a different composition than the material that was less than 0.2 microns. And the distribution of those fractions across the equator as a function of depth was very different. This was in a, a deep water mass. This water mass was actually upwelling. Um, this is along the equator. And it was very suggestive of very old refractory material, much less th like the old refractory material that you find from terrestrial environments. Whereas the material that had a flatter slope and a larger size, colloidal, was found primarily in the surface, associated with phytoplankton blooms in these two regions. And so, again, it allows you to, by looking at changes in the optical properties, it allows you to start to say something about the composition of the material. And so something as simple as the difference in slope can tell you something about origin or processing or something ecological about the material. So it becomes important when you're measuring absorption to do a good job so that you can begin to resolve the spectral slope. So we'll be measuring CDOM today and looking at some variations in the overall magnitude of absor absorption and in the slope. So in a lot of years ago, I, <laughs> I compiled, um, I actually digitized all of the CDOM absorption spectra that were available at the time published. And I digitized them and then I calculated what the spectral slope was for all of those absorption spectra. And came up with sort of an average slope and then I, I was in the optics class in Friday Harbor and so I looked at all the spectral slopes for the Friday Harbor waters and that was what this study was. And I found that the slopes, that spectral slope of the exponential was about 0.016 or 0.017. But that was a thousand years ago, right? Not too many years ago, Marcel Babin, his colleagues went around European coastal waters, like all over European coastal waters, measuring absorption by CDOM and calculating the spectral slope. And this is the histogram of the spectral slope. And wouldn't you know it, 0 0.016, 0 0.017. Which means that it's a pretty robust measure of the spectral slope. Yes, there are certainly lower values and those likely have very different molecular structures. There are higher values, but those will be telling you something about the environment. Overall, most of the CDOM has a pretty predictable slope. So if you're modeling CDOM, you can do a pretty good job with a single slope, understanding that variations from that slope are actually going to be meaningful for you. Okay. So when we start talking about modeling, um, we'll talk about modeling these slopes. Okay. Any questions on CDOM? Okay. So now we're going to look at the other part of our sample. So we filtered it in the lab or in the field. 
and you'll get a, a filter and you'll have your particles suspended on it and you will measure it in a spectrophotometer and measure its absorption as a function of wavelength. So that's the scan of the particulate. Um, and so this might be a resulting spectrum. This one has a lot of phytoplankton in it. There's the chlorophyll peak here and here. Here's some other pigments in here. There's some material that's absorbing in the UV, but it's not sedum because these are particles. Then we take that filter, and what you'll do on tomorrow, you'll put it back in the filter cup, and you'll put methanol on it. And what methanol does is dissolves the pigments out of the cells, and you flush them out. And so you're depigmenting the filter pad. You'll still see color on the filter pad, but it'll be sort of yellowish. It won't look green or whatever color your phytoplankton are. So you go through this methanol extraction, and then you're going to scan it again in the spectrophotometer. And you'll get a spectrum that looks something like this. Okay. Exponential, not perfectly exponential. There's often some sort of curvature here. That is the absorption by the non-extractable particulate matter. So we call it the unpigmented material. Some people say it's detritus. It's probably detritus, but it's also the cellular material of living organisms as well. Bacteria, zooplankton, and even phytoplankton, just not their pigments. So you'll see a history of naming this detritus, tr uh, trypton, uh, non-algal particles. I think the community is kind of most recently calling it non-algal particles, although it contains the cellular material of phytoplankton, it's just not their pigments. And if you do the difference, you come up with the absorption by phytoplankton, but it's the absorption by the phytoplankton pigments as they were when they were in the cell, which is very, very different from taking phytoplankton, extracting them, and measuring the absorption on the extract, which is the absorption by pigments not in the cell or in vitro. So you're going to do those. I think you'll, you'll measure the difference between those. But this allows you to, to derive this absorption by phytoplankton in vivo or in the cell. So this is a very common method that we use. And we'll see that there's a lot of complications by putting materials on a filter and trying to measure it. But we do it. We have done it. And we continue to do it, even though we have absorption meters that can go in the ocean because it's the only way of separating the phytoplankton pigments from the other particulate matter to derive what the absorption spectrum of phytoplankton are. If we could figure out a different way to do it, we would be doing it, but we're not there yet. Um, there's another way to measure the absorption by phytoplankton. This is a very old figure. I'm sorry. It's from, from the 80s. But um, Rodolfo Triaga and Dave Siegel set up a spectrophotometer that was attached to a microscope where they could literally measure the absorption spectrum of individual particles. It took him days per sample <laughs> because, of course, you need to measure the absorption by all the particles. So they would go over a phytoplankton, they would change the aperture, go right around the phytoplankton, and then measure the absorption by knowing the intensity incident and the intensity transmitted. A, as a function of wavelength. And so this is the absorption spectrum of one phytoplankton. This is another phytoplankton. So yeah, you could do this, and you could measure the absorption of every particle in the ocean. But right, this is one sample. So, um, so yeah, you can actually get absorption by individual cells, but it's, it's tricky. Um, so. There's a lot of natural variability in the absorption spectra. So here's a bunch of absorption spectra for different species. And they've been normalized to the area under the curve so that you can compare just the shapes and it's removing the effective biomass. And so you can see that they all have the red peak with the chlorophyll A. They all have a blue peak associated with chlorophyll A. But then there's lots of differences in here, in here, certainly differences in this region. And each of these regions is associated with the absorption spectrum of different pigments. And it turns out that there's a relatively robust um, 
approach to using pigments to tell you what taxonomic group your phytoplankton in. There's always exceptions, but when you have phytoplankton that have no absorption in this area, you're probably looking at a, at a green alga. It doesn't, they don't have a lot of pigments in this area compared to say diatoms and dinoflagellates. This peak right here is chlorophyll B. So you can use the shape of this curve to tell you what pigments you have in your sample and tell you something about the phytoplankton composition. So, and here they are. We've, I, there's an example of identifying some of those pigments. There's also phycobilly pigments, which are associated with cyanobacteria and some other chromophytes. They have big, big absorption, particularly in the green. And Mary Jane will talk more about this. The absorption spectra, in addition to, for phytoplankton, in addition to changing as a function of pigments, also changes as a function of how much pigment you have in the cell. And so this is from a very old study um, by Morel and Bracco talking about how the shape of the absorption spectrum changes depending upon how much pigment you've packed in the cell. So you can imagine that if you have a small cell or a large cell, in your mind put this not as a sphere but as a phytoplankton, they may have the same internal pigment concentration, right? That's why they're the same color. But if you imagine that you have incident light and transmitted light, the amount of absorption that happens through this cell is much less than the amount of absorption that will happen through this cell. Why? Longer path, Longer path length. And so as you move through the spectrum and you shine different colors of light through that cell, if it happens to be at a wavelength, where the pigment is a very strong absorber, that color of light may not actually make it out the other side. It may all be absorbed. And what happens is that leads to a flattened peak. So you might be able to resolve this peak because all of the light at each one of these wavelengths makes it through and you detect it. But as you get to bigger and bigger cells, some of the far blue light doesn't make it through, so absorption is maximal. And it just continues to be maximal because you're just not getting any light out the other side until you get to a point where the absorption by the cell at that wavelength starts to decrease and you start to get light out the other side and your absorption goes down. So the change in the shape of the spectrum, the flattening of the peaks tells you something about either the size of the particle, bigger particles tend to have flatter peaks because you can get a lot more pigment in there, or you can have two cells of the same size but with different internal concentrations. And so you will have lower absorption through this cell which has a lower pigment concentration compared to this cell of the exact same size which has a much higher internal concentration. So when you see flattened peaks, it's telling you something about your phytoplankton. It's saying either you have big phytoplankton or you have phytoplankton that have a much higher internal concentration of pigment. If you take cells of the same species, how could you possibly get a variation in the internal concentration of pigment? Different depths. Different depths. Why? Photoadaptation. Photoadaptation is the response, the natural response of phytoplankton to light stress. As you lower them in the water column and the light level becomes lower and lower, they're trying to make a living with light. And so they're going to put more pigment into the cell so that they can absorb more light around them. But in doing so, by increasing that internal concentration, they're increasing their efficiency of absorption, which is the game that they're after but it also increases the, the packaging of the pigment in that cell and changes its absorption spectrum. Okay. So the shape of the curve, again, tells you something about what's going on molecularly um, within, the, within the organism in terms of the, how the pigment is packaged and the arrangements. Okay. Um, let's see. So, some variations in phytoplankton absorption that have to do with large cells versus small cells. This is the absorption per chlorophyll. Small cells 
which um, have very, are very peaked in their absorption compared to large cells, which are flat.